Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Hub24 is on a mission to empower advisors to deliver better financial futures for their clients. They're dedicated to customer service excellence and delivering innovative product solutions that create value for advisors and their clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors rate them number one for overall satisfaction and why their managed portfolio solution has been rated best in market five years running. Hub24 believes nothing happens in isolation. So they're working together with advisors, licensees, and industry leaders to leverage their data and technology expertise to help solve key challenges in the delivery of financial advice so more Australians can access cost-effective advice. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and today I'm joined by Amanda Kassar. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for hanging out in the same room as me in the Gold Coast. Sorry to say that rest of the country that are in lockdown, uh, but we are still allowed to uh, communicate in person. We are, and it's the Gold Coast Show Day holiday, and it's the only show that's happening in all of Australia, so how lucky are we? And everyone else is just rolling their eyes going. <laughs> Get sharp. Oh. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> hey, thanks for catching up. Uh, it's been some time since you were on the XY Advisor podcast. Has been. But uh, look, tell us, let's go back, let's quickly go back a step. Tell us about you, your career, your journey. How did you become a financial planner? Well, like everybody, I fell into it. I certainly yeah. didn't leave school going, that's what I want to do. I actually don't even think I'd ever heard of the words financial advisor when I was at school. So I ended up working for a friend of my dad's who was an old lifey. He um, sold insurance and super, was with MLC, became his secretary. <laughs> Uh, and over time, somehow we just turned into uh, personal assistance to a financial advisor instead of a secretary to a lifey. So it that started in about 91, 92, pretty much straight out of high school. Uh, stopped, got married, had my kids, came back and was qualified as an advisor in January 2001. So I've just hit my 20-year anniversary wow. as an advisor. <laughs> wow. And, and you're one of the few that decided to go and get their master's earlier on before all I the FACIA yeah. stuff came in? Yeah, well, look, it had been talked about since I joined, you know, one day we would have to have a degree. So I just went, you know what, how about I go early? And when everyone's scrambling, I'm done. So (laughs) it it worked, it worked. Yeah, a little bit of forethought goes in there. Now, uh, look, uh, you've obviously run your practice, as you said, for a long time here on the Gold Coast. You've got a fairly substantial business here. Uh, You've taken on advisors over time. Your kids have ended up in the business. Yeah, we're very much a family business. My son is an advisor. He's uh, 25 soon and my daughter as my um, client service manager. So, yep. Wow. Real, fam- real family business. What uh, what made them want to get involved? Well, they both swore to me blind. They would never work with me. So at high school, I said, look, you know, mum's got a business if you're ever interested. So my son went, yeah, no thanks. I'll become a mechanic. And my daughter went, yeah, no thanks. I'll become a um, makeup artist like every other girl on the Gold Coast. <laughs> um, and after a couple of years, I think Mitch just decided he was going to have, you know, dirty fingernails and probably not earn more than 50 grand a year for the rest of his life. Um, you know, sometimes things just don't turn out the way you think. So he turned up one day and said, look, can I start doing my course, my diploma of financial planning back then? And I said, well, yeah, but you're halfway through an apprenticeship. I'd really love you to finish that. And um, – yeah, he didn't. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, fair. yeah, but he's got his graduate diploma now, so he's finished his um, bridging yeah. and courses too. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's funny because then then you uh, then you get to live with them and then also take them to work and work with them as well. <laughs> well, so. thankfully he moved out five years ago, so oh, that's right. one down. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So, uh, look, tell us as as you've come through. One of the things I really wanted to talk to you today about um, was some of the stuff you've been doing recently. Uh, in the financial abuse space. But before we get to that, let's go back and tell us sort of about how that began, uh, which really began with you writing a book. Yeah, it did. I, um, you know, like everyone, you sort of kick around. I'd love to write a book one day. And I knew I didn't want it to be about how to do a budget, you know, the, the boring stuff. So it sort of had a few incarnations before it happened. And I got really fascinated hearing about people's stories about growing up and what was family life like and what lessons did your parents teach you about money. So I sort of developed a series of questions to work through. 
and find out what motivated people. Did they believe those stories, whether they were spoken or unspoken, that their parents taught them? You know, things like money doesn't grow on trees or, you know, it takes money to make money. And there was one particular story when I did those 18 interviews that just blew me away about a lady whose husband had taken financial advantage of her. She was an award-winning investigative journalist who walked in owning property, money in the bank, trust funds, and came away completely broken. She ended up having a stroke, got adult onset epilepsy. She'd been stealing money from the groceries to put aside in food vouchers so that when her and her daughter could finally flee, she'd have money for food for a few months. So it was so unlike anything I'd ever heard of before. Um, you know, I've been married for 100 years, respectful relationship, um, parents, you know, and it was very 1950s, our parents, you know, the dad was the breadwinner, mum might have worked part-time, uh, but never heard of anything like that. So it just fascinated me and I thought, well, why haven't I heard more about this? Does this happen much or is this guy just a one-off freak? And I suppose the more I looked into it, the more I uncovered and the more I was horrified and started speaking about it on the international platform with MDRT. And it also piqued the interest of Michelle Hoskin, who I know is a friend of the XY podcast, has appeared, Little Miss Wow. And even she sort of thought, look, there's more to this. Advisors need to know about this, not just, um, you know, end customers on how to get out. So we sort of put our heads together between the US and the UK and Australia on our visits and came up with the idea of doing a specialist accreditation. Yeah, now that's now we probably fast forward a little bit into this. Uh, you're exactly right. This is an amazing story and we want to uncover this. Before we before we dive into this particular story and how that happened, I just want to go back to the book conversation. Sure. So to start with, why did you want to write a book? I think, look, I was actually more interested in writing a bodice-busting romance <laughs> at one stage, but thought maybe I'd get more credibility writing something about finance that I actually knew about. <laughs> so that was the motivate. Look, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader. I can't go to sleep at night without reading. I read close to 100 books a year, and you know it just made sense to me that one day I'd, I'd have my name on one. So... But, yeah, just wanted it to be a bit different to the run-of-the-mill stuff. Fantastic. And money stories is something that comes naturally to you as as an advisor, asking questions about, mm. you know, people's upbringings. It, it's sort of like the basis of every financial plan you've ever written, right? What what are people's beliefs around money? What do – what are their, their – um, uh, what are the things that are holding them back? What are the what are the obstacles they need to overcome? You know, what are all the things that their parents taught them as a kid that are maybe wrong, uh, and they need to then relearn and, and re-educate? So, so yep. this this conversation around having these money conversations is nothing new to any of the financial advisors. Not at all. Tell me about some of the questioning and thoughts around what what were some of those questions that you went into when you wanted to know how to elicit that money story out of a human. Well, it was more about what did your parents teach you about money, and often you just hit this blank stare going, nothing. You know, they, they didn't teach me anything. So then you have to go a bit deeper and go, what were some of those unspoken stories? You know, was it about getting a good job, working hard? Um, was it about, you know, doing the nine to five? Or was it be, being entrepreneurial because your parents were? So then they sort of would open up and go, oh, yeah, actually, dad was a really hard worker. He was a builder or, you know, mum was the stay at home. So it would just opened up the stories about their lives And what was really interesting was the intergenerational stories that came back. I mean, you and I are Gen X, I think, so our parents are baby boomers. So they grew up post-war. So that generation came from a very scarcity mindset. You know, post-war they had to, you know, you hear the stories from grandma, great-grandma about living on the bread and dripping and making your shoe leather last. And, you know, so they came from this reduce, reuse, recycle kind of life. You know, my father was an avid composter and everything had to last and you wouldn't buy anything until it wore out. So those kind of stories played through in generations, which was really interesting too. But then we come down to Gen Y and our children who've never had hardship you know, there was been this world of abundance for 50, 60 years. They haven't been through a war that's impacted them. They've never not known that, well, if it breaks, I'll throw it away and buy a new one. That's just how it works. So that even opened up stories about young children going, well, Dad, my iPad's broken. Or do you just go, well, right, I'll get you a new one? Or do you have to then teach them the value or the time factor that it takes to earn that? So some parents are all over that going, look, I can't just run out and do that. This is what it will take. You have to earn it. And others are just like, no, no, 
you know, I'll just just supply it. So it's very interesting people's responses to those questions and and what it brought out. Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of first world problems when it comes to the uh, the next generation. Of course, running out of internet and Wi Fi is the end of the world. <laughs> we know that. Um, but uh, but look. Uh, uh, yeah, this is really interesting, these money stories. I, I like the concept that we're just a ball of emotion and, and past experience and, you know, all of all of we, we've seen, not necessarily being officially taught, but all of we've seen has justified this thing inside our brains as to how we treat and believe and, and think about money. Um, so with the book, you put that together, you then went and interviewed, was it 18 people? Did you yes, say? yep. And, uh, and how did that go? With, with, you know, how did you go about that, just interviewing, did taking notes? How, what, what was the process? Uh, look, it was probably Zoom before its time. Uh, there was people who are surviving on Centrelink and government pensions, uh, right through to multi-millionaire you know, award-winning business owners, um, someone who's opened a global charity. So I wanted the whole spectrum. You know, how do you make ends meet living on your $700 a fortnight or $900 a fortnight to what's life like for you when money isn't a problem? And sometimes... The money stories were um, scarier at the top end <laughs> than the bottom end. And in the meantime, I think I'd also been doing my trips with the Hunger Project to Uganda, India, Malawi, and seeing people survive at, you know, in Malawi is one of the 10 poorest countries on earth. So to see these people scrabbling to make a living, it, it gives you much different perspective on life as well and problems and, you know, what really is an issue, like you said, <laughs> you know, while Wi-Fi is a bit slow, like... It's, it's not that big a deal. Um, so it was just fascinating to draw people out and hear. And people, I mean, you're asking them about their favourite subject themselves. So, you know, it's it's very easy to listen and understand. Only one person came back to me and went, you know what, now that I've had this conversation with you, I'm actually really uncomfortable and I don't want you to include my story in the book, which is fair enough. So that, that one got dropped. But, yeah, it was, it was a privilege that people would open up to me and share. And some had gone completely the opposite from what their parents had taught them. You know, they'd come from this scarcity mindset and they're just like, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder at every dollar I spend and where does it go? And, you know, they've discovered abundance and, you know, they've turned their lives into this mindset of abundance. So it doesn't mean whatever story we've learned or been told has to be our final story, which was also fascinating to uncover. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because that's the moment when somebody makes a conscious decision Whereas everybody else is just going with the unconscious decision of Those I'm just biases, going to yeah. continue because I haven't actually had the time to think about it. And sometimes that story and getting it out into the book or having a conversation with you about it allows them to be able to go, I didn't even think about that was my story. I didn't even realize it was my story. But now that I do, I can actually make a decision to what to think about what my future story is going to be. Mm. Well, that lady I spoke to with the financial abuse, her story is growing up. Like they drive past nice houses and her father would say things like, they must be drug dealers. You have to be a bad person to get ahead in this world. So, and she's still to this day, you know, she's um, in her 40s, has to control it when that pops into her head that someone who's doing well must be a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> because it is so ingrained. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's and, worth and questioning. I, and I guess the other thing too when you're writing a book um, is, you know, content and, it, it, you know, 18 stories, 18 different um, chapters if you like, but it's endless, isn't it? Because every single person has a story. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I just didn't want it to be one type. So there's stories from advisors as well, how they became advisors. So what are their top tips for their clients? What did they learn growing up from their parents? How did they end up as an advisor? Because like I said, none of us leave school going, I'm going to be a financial advisor when I grow <laughs> up. So, you know, we all came into it, from, fell into it from some other means, whether it was bank tellers or stockbrokers. So yep. it was fascinating, you know, discovering their motivation and stories too and, and what they like to share with their clients. And this, you know, some very basic themes that, that come through it all. Yeah, exactly. They're all falling into it. I fell into it from uh, a life of being a chef. Uh, your son fell into it from the life of being a mechanic. So it, it's not all the bankers and stockbrokers. And the, the, one of the guys in the book's a drummer. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. perfect, perfect. Uh, As you do. Now, talk to me about the book, because the evolution of the book has been, obviously, um, published a, a few years back. Um, now, uh, you're turning that into a podcast. Yes, I am. It should be released in the next couple of weeks. So pretty much going back to those that same group of people and um, asking those questions again. And most of them, look, it's, it was three or four years ago. So their stories have moved on since then as well. And um, even interviewing Michelle, who's worked with financial advisors all her life, she turned around and said, you know, nobody's ever asked me that stuff. And now I have to think about what I'm going to teach Ruby because I haven't thought about 
consciously teaching her things. So even inviting those stories, you know, then makes for, well, okay, I got taught nothing. What am I going to teach my kids? Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah. the evolution of the story continues. It does. Um, so the podcast uh, that you're doing, um, have done, is, is the uh, the series of the 18 stories. Yes. Um, but then I think it's probably going to, now that we've discovered, as you said, one of the stories led you down a new pathway towards the financial abuse conversation uh, and peace. T- tell me about that uh, evolution. We sort of mentioned it before, how yep. that started. Um, but then where has that led you to? Well, I think I mentioned putting together the course. Um, we figured that, if I hadn't heard of it after being in advice pretty much all my life, what other advisors hasn't? So I started asking those questions. God, I'm nosy, aren't I? So <laughs> we go to advisors. Have you heard about financial abuse? Have you ever seen a case? You know, all these people in the UK going, what are you talking about, Amanda? And mostly the answer was no, haven't seen it, don't know what you're talking about. But there were two or three advisors who is, is said, it, yeah. Is it hasn't seen it or hasn't noticed it? Well, they wouldn't know what the red flags are yeah. to identify yeah. it. So, yeah, um, probably should go back to them once they yeah. <laughs> once they understand. But look, more uh, elder abuse cases. There were where their elderly clients were being abused by children. So a few had uncovered that. And look, elder abuse is just a very small part of economic abuse as a whole. Yeah, okay. So if we talk about economic abuse and elder abuse being a subset, what are the other subsets? Partner abuse is, is the main one. And Look, I'm generalising, but it's usually the woman because she isn't always a breadwinner. She might be taking time off to care for young people or elderly people. So her partner is in a position of control, for want of a better word. And finances is is the easiest way out of all of them to control someone. I know they did a a survey in the States and found that 99% of all domestic violence cases include financial abuse over there. And I think that stat is in the low 90s here in Australia. So it's certainly widespread and part of a bigger issue. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? I guess it's a, it's a horrible thing to think about, but I'm, would, I'm surprised it's not 100%. As in, pretty much as I guess in the UK, I'm surprised it's not high here. The concept of you know uh, domestic violence or domestic abuse um, also including you know the, the finances. Yep. So there's the emotional as well. There's, you know, there's, it just comes down to so many parts. And they've also found that minority groups are very, very prone to it. So in Australia, that would be people in the uh, lesbian and gay community. It's quite rampant there. People where English is a second language and also where um, societies are a patriarchy. It's, it's very, very common in those societies too. Is that because it's harder for people to reach out if they're being abused? Definitely. So the immigrant community, it is difficult if they don't have um, a support network. Um, if English isn't their first language or they, they're very, um, ha- it's hard to express themselves um, to be understood. And it can also be quite traditional for them. So they don't know any different as well. So there's cases where people actually haven't realised they're being financially abused. Yeah, this is an interesting point. So it's not just a, it's not just a black or white, you know, on or off switch. This is a spectrum between somewhere along the line, of, yeah, stealing $20 from the nightstand to <laughs> the changing way, the wheel. Yeah. All the way through to some horrific stories, I would yeah. imagine. So talk to us about that spectrum then, where that lies and what, what uh, I guess, because to me, I think that the idea of talking about it and, and understanding what it might look like um, will help people then re- both recognise it in, in others or it could recognise in some of the stuff that they're doing themselves. Yeah, sure. I know an advisor uncovered a story recently where uh, he met with a husband and wife and in the course of their conversation uncovered that the wife was the breadwinner, but the husband had made her put all his all her earnings into his bank account. She did have she had no bank account of her own. And um, as it turns out, when I was approached to, you know, offer some feedback on the situation, in the state of Victoria coercive control is now a crime and they are looking at doing that in other states of Australia. So that was a a bit of a win, but that's just one form of financial abuse. The other red flags can be anything from, you know, elderly parents um, not being taken seriously. You know, I know I had that other term deposit and I can't find my paperwork. I don't know where that's gone. Um, Making a single person a power of attorney can easily lead to abuse because that person has all the power. And look, it's not always convenient to have a second person, but boy, it can protect you. Mm. <laughs> so, um, and like I said, you know, stealing money off the nightstand or out of your wallet to, you know, making forcibly changing documents like wills and powers of attorney, fraudulent insurance claims in your name that they get you to sign off on, might ask you to sign documents that you don't know what you're signing that can be loans in your name. So that the spectrum 
is huge. I, I feel like everybody's on the spectrum at some point. As in, as in, every single client might have a uh, like. If it's a part, if it's a, if it's two people, there might be one person who's more interested in the finances than the other. So they sort of take charge of the finances in a way, and they'll be like, "Oh, I'll pay the bills and make sure the money's are coming in. We'll put the money over there and do that." And the other person in the in the relationship goes, "Oh, that's great. You know, Absolutely, they're doing that." But then, how does that not be classed as financial abuse? I guess if the and well, where, it's if you're working, what, the I suppose, point? to a common goal. Yeah. If, you know, and most people do have someone who just abdicates that role. They just don't want to be part of it, don't want to be involved. It's not their forte and they're happy to just go, you know what, you take care of it. And the hope is that it will be in your joint best interest. So, yep. so while it is in your joint best interest, the bills are being paid, there's food on the table, you're working towards joint goals of whether that's buying a house or going on a holiday or having children, you know, it, it's working. So the person isn't undermining you. They're not stripping you of your, you know, you're not put on a budget of, you know, you can only do groceries $50 a week or, you know, you can't go and earn a living for yourself or I forbid you from doing these types of roles or getting extra education. So even little things like that are part yeah. of the control. So how can advisors work with their clients to then, so that they understand, the advisor understands that that that, that relationship is working well and that person is not feeling like they're left in the dark? It's questions. You know, yep. we, we sometimes we get that gut feeling when we're sitting there and it, it may be that every time we ask a question directly of the wife, the husband talks over the top of her or doesn't allow her to answer or she seems very withdrawn, unwilling to contribute. And like I said, I'm generalising, but it can work both ways. So it's just being aware of those little signs. And sometimes it might just be, look, i just make a file note of that. I don't think I need to take it any further just yet. But if there's a pattern over time, it might be then worth you know, making a bigger deal of it. Seeing if you can get the attention of the person who is non-dominant. Now, I guess there's something I've spoken to you in the past for, as you said, it's, it's often uh, in a male female relationship that the female ends up in that um, uh, role where they're not involved or they don't feel like they're involved. But it could be the other way. It's it's, it's more to me, it feels more like an alpha um, dominant. Alpha personality alpha, type. Alpha yeah. personality type. Um, and, or, or as you said before, the word controlling. If somebody feels like they need to control that section because it might be a way of them controlling part of the relationship. Absolutely. Um, so going back to the advisor, recognising that, trying to trying to find a way in or a conversation with the non-dominant person to make sure that they're okay and happy? Yeah, there's, there's a formula that psychologists use, and I know I've mentioned it for, before, where you use the, the formula, I feel, when, because. So you're not going, look, mate, I think your partner's all over you. You know, you need to get this sorted. It can be... I feel really uncomfortable when I hear that Bill won't let you have that new pair of shoes or the grocery money or whatever it is because I understand that that's a form of control. So that, you know, I feel whatever you feel, angry, upset, hurt, mad, when, whatever the situation was that triggered you because – so what you're doing is you're talking about your own feelings. So it's very hard for the person to come around and go, how dare you feel that? You know, it's it's not going on the attack. It's it's the softly, softly approach – and that may even give you an idea of whether the person is afraid of their partner and go, look, just let it be. You know, in a domestic violence case, we certainly don't want, you know, that the partner's going to go home and belt the, you know, the partner. And, you know, you've you've been in a situation where you've caused something like that. Um, so the softly, softly approach is, you know, I think that just takes the sting out of the start. And look, if you've got a situation where you're worried about that, then of course you need extra help. Yep. And uh, what about advice who are you know, just predominantly deal with one person in the relationship? Well, then you just don't know. Yeah. And look, there's plenty of times where, you know, we've just dealt with the one person, but, you know, it's really nice to then go, look, I'd love to meet your partner. You know, can they come in on the next interview? You know, I'm happy to sit back after hours and do a Zoom with you both if, you know, it's hard with his work time. So just that you, you're you putting your own mind at ease then. And I think sometimes with the advice that you're getting as well, you you know when you're putting it together, if it's in the best interest of a couple or not. It's not like they're coming to if, you know, if someone comes and says, Look, I don't want my partner to know about this or, you know, I've got an ex and she doesn't need to know about this money. People tell you things. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty obvious sometimes when they're out to do something dodgy. And l- listening uh, listening between the words as well. Um, tell me about the in this scenario, because I've, you've, you've shared lots of stories with me over time and, and we're probably going to draw some of those out uh, on the podcast. Um, talk to me about some of the, the, the states around um, elder, um, uh, you know, elder abuse. We're talking about, you know, maybe aged care clients, those sorts of things. Because uh, it's often a difficult scenario for an advisor to be in with, with an aged care scenario. Who's the client? 
who's who's the other client you know mm. you, you know there's intergenerational you, you've got both the carer and and the person um that needs the help uh, as the client talk to me about those some of the stories you've heard there um for me personally when i'm giving aged care advice the advice is always for the client entering care that they are the client and look probably seven out of ten times i will never meet that client they're either already in care, they have dementia and can't take their care of their own affairs. We have to get copies of the powers of attorney, keep those on file. Um, I haven't come across a case where the children turn up to me and they're trying to help mum and dad where I think they're doing the wrong thing. I have when I've gone onto radio shows and talked about um, elder abuse or granny dumping or you know these phenomenons that then people ring me with their stories and they're the ones that are heartbreaking because, you know, they, they might have given the daughter-in-law the power of attorney and she's changed the, you know, DVA pension into her bank account and left the state and they've got no money to, you know, pay their own bills. So it, it's horrific some of the stuff that comes out. I, I remember one afternoon I was on 4CRB and they didn't they pre-recorded so I didn't know when the story was going to air. But, geez, I knew that afternoon my office got probably half a dozen phone calls of people just going, oh, sweetie, I think I'm, I'm being abused. Um, what do I do? And what's worse is when they've lost capacity. So if they can't revoke a power of attorney um, and change it, you know, that that's really, really heartbreaking. So, Yeah, that is that is an absolutely crazy thing to, think, to actually think about, you know, the fact that if you have signed over a power of attorney to somebody and you've lost the capacity, then that's the person forever, right? Yeah, well, unless you can go to a lawyer and, and somehow get that overturned or somebody can be appointed as, you know, a guardian instead, then, yeah, it's it's very difficult. Now, you just mentioned granny dumping, which sounds horrific. What does that mean? <laughs> granny dumping is this uh, incredible phenomenon that actually does happen in Australia as well as yeah, pretty much every country around the world. And it's brought on most often out of desperation by carers when they are just at their wits' end. They need help. They can't get it. They can no longer, you know, support the person that they're supposed to be caring for and they get dumped. So often at a hospital in uh, holiday season would be the highest form where they, you know, turn up at emergency, dad needs help, I'll just go park the car and don't come back. Some of them will come back after the holidays because they just needed the break but haven't organised, you know, proper respite or something like that. One of the uh, worst cases in the world was an American man and his partner took his elderly father to the UK, um, put him in all new clothes, took all his identification and left him at a bus stop and um, arranged for a friend to basically raise the alarm and say, oh, look, I just found this poor gentleman. Uh, he has dementia. We don't know where he belongs or who he is. And they ended up tracking down the people who'd done this and it was prosecuted. So it was probably one of the most prominent cases of, of granny dumping out there. Oh my God, um, that sounds horrific. Uh, talk to me. Yeah, you mentioned during the holidays. Is that just because you know a carer doesn't get any time off in ever? Once you're a carer, you're a full time carer. It's twenty four seven, three sixty five. Yeah, days pretty a year. much. And look, granny dumping. It, it's it sounds horrible, and it is horrible. But often it can be done more out of desperation than malice. And I think families need to be a whole lot more aware. And prepared to help out because if someone is a full time carer, they they do need a break. You know, often you'll hear of the person who's the carer in a partnership dying long before the person they're caring for because they're exhausted. They're just so worn out and want a break and yeah. get the permanent sleep. So it's good for families to kick in and go, right, can we help out with pop over the holidays or can you know, can we get two weeks of respite for Nan so that you can have two weeks just to be with your own family or do nothing or read a book or go on holiday, whatever it is. So being aware of caring for carers is really important. I think it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And for financial advisors listening to this and thinking about their client base, um, if somebody is a carer, then they need to be aware of that scenario because, again, it pushes people to the absolute limit. And look, we're, we're living in the middle of a pandemic with half the country in lockdown. So if you weren't driven to the limit before, things are pretty bloody tough now. Yep. So, you know, just a care package or a phone call might be all that's needed to lift someone's spirits and pioneer on for a bit longer. Yep, yep. Um, now, you mentioned, el el so that's elder abuse. Uh, you've spoken to me before about the concept of gaslighting. Can you can you <laughs> tell me about that? <laughs> yeah, gaslighting, the, the word was coined from an old movie where the woman was basically made to feel like she was going crazy. You know, her partner would question everything she'd done, undermine everything she'd done, um, lie and deny, you know, things in the relationship until she thought she was mad. And that can happen in relationships too as part of emotional and financial abuse. Um, so, 
it, there's there's so much complexity and and it to me it's I suppose so far out of my own personal nature and the people I know that they would do this kind of thing that it's hard to believe that there are people out there that do that and look in the last two weeks I've had two single recently separated clients walk into my office both moving on from a narcissist so you know there's these new stories out there now about these narcissistic relationships as well and, and gaslighting is a big part of the narcissist um you know and control again well wow. so making people think that they're crazy pretty much well wow. god uh no, okay. So you've written, uh, you've written. Uh, uh, you, this this has ex- helped you explore a lot of different areas, and I guess the more you look, the more you find. Uh, as you mentioned before, you've written some work or done some work with um, uh, uh, Standards International, and creating a course on this. Mm-hmm. Yep, and next will be the book and the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us about the course. Tell us about how that works. So the course is designed pretty much purely for advisors but we're also getting a lot of interest from other people in legal professions and that that just want to know a bit more about it so look please don't think we're going to go in and um you know explain the the mental health concepts and all that you know we're about advisors so what the first thing it does is uncover you know what's the definition what are the red flags so what are the things you should be looking for uh why should an advisor care you know what what's in it for us basically and then what are, what are the options? Because this certainly isn't something that has a cookie cutter approach where you go, right, I'll just follow these three steps and bingo, whack a ding, whack a do, we're, we're all done. So it goes through how to approach things and then also masses of resources. So for Australian clients, there's uh, toolkits and elder abuse hotline numbers and organisations and communities that can help. We've done that for every country that's involved. So the US, the UK, Canada, South Africa. So we've put all the resources for you locally together and the idea is that basically you come out with your own toolkit or policy for your business so that if you then come across this or you're someone who specializes in single professional women or divorced women or whatever your niche is it's just this other I suppose you know arrow in your quiver that you've got where you can go right I I don't know what I'm doing here I'm out of my depth what can I do but having that you know, policy in place that you go, right, I've, I've done this, I, I've got my hand all over it and can help out. Yeah, it seems to me like it should be, well, for larger practices, it should be somebody in, in the practice needs to step into this so that uh, they can look out throughout the entire practice. But Which doesn't have to be an advisor. So there are some practices who are putting admin staff through it. Yep. And uh, it also it also provides a lot of content for to talk about, to actually get out there into the community, into the local community, into the client base, all those sorts of things to start having those conversations. I think it's a good um, area. I mean, obviously part of what I do is produce content. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's rich with content to be able to produce to get out to your own community. Absolutely. So we've interviewed people who were victims of financial abuse and come out the other side with their stories. We've interviewed advisors who've witnessed it and how they've handled it, what they've done. And I've even got a family lawyer in there who's looked at it from their side as they go through the separation and and what we can do with the whole, I suppose, upshot of the course is what can we do as advisors when we come across it? Because I think the traditional response would be, this is too hard. I'm going to excuse myself. I'm not qualified to do this. And Now that we've got best interest duty, you know, are we meeting best interest by going, I'm walking away? And look, maybe in some cases we are, but it could be, well, can I find someone who knows what they're talking about and say, look, I think you'll be in better hands with a financial abuse specialist and I'm going to pass it to that person. So it's the same as, you know, if I can't do aged care, you give it to a specialist. If I can't do risk, I'll do that. So this will be another area where we can go, look, we want to refer to people who are all over it. Yeah, fantastic. Now, now it's a um, it's a global standards certification. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a course and a certification uh, from Standards International, which is the UK based, but it's obviously uh, it, it covers around. So even though most of it's been written in Australia, it's it's a uh, it's global. It is, yeah. And look, the AFA have awarded eight points at this stage. Having said that, I've put so much more content into it since then. I might yep. need to get it reassessed. Yep. Um, but yeah, look, it, it's relevant wherever you are in the world. That you know the. the the red flags don't change. The behaviours don't change. We're all people wherever you find us. So it's designed to help everywhere. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the, the financial side of it, whilst we all have different products in different countries, it doesn't really matter when it comes to this. Uh, fantastic. How can people find out more about that or, or go to the website? Yeah, so the website is standardsinternational.co.uk. They have a tab up the top called Courses. You can find Financial Abuse Specialist under that or either reach out to myself or Michelle Hoskin. Um, we're both on Twitter, LinkedIn. Look, you can find us on any social. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. <laughs> any and every, you mean. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, so, so this is obviously not finished. This is not a piece that you've just created and, and that's the end of it. It sounds to me or it feels to me like you're going to be coming across a whole lot of more stories and cases and things that, to uncover. Yeah, we're actually arranging that, okay, even if you get this, the international certification up front, every year we want you to do a refresher because things do change. And, you know, at the moment the big story is Britney Spears and conservatorship. So we don't really have conservatorship here, but we do have people who are guardians or, you know, they've been given this power of attorney over a person. And look, lover or hater as an artist, you know, does anyone deserve to be, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years where she has zero control over her own career, her life, her earnings. Um, you know, is it fair? Will she ever get out of it? You know, the laws in California for this pretty much show that it's unlikely. And it went on to do another case, the old Peter Falk who played Columbo. His second wife uh, had a conservatorship over him and even stopped him seeing his own children. So it's not something that just affects, you know, Mr and Mrs Blog down the street or the immigrant community. You know, there's these celebrities who are caught up in this as well. And there's some fascinating cases of both financial and economic abuse in um, celebrity land. Um, poor Stan Lee, who we all love from uh, the Marvel movies, was taken for a ride as well. So it's been really interesting delving into the cases that, you know, like from the, the stories I saw, you know, sitting in a mud hut in Malawi through to these, you know, multi-millionaires, you know, that we've all heard of that are household names. It just doesn't discriminate. No, exactly right. And and the celebrity stories are the ones that are brought to light, but I guess within the a client base of of a financial advisor's business, there's probably there's probably a couple of stories in each one where you could uh, start looking out for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just having that understanding of, right, I'm not comfortable with this, what do I do? And look, whether it's make a file note or call the cops, you need to know. So, And unfortunately, I think the pandemic is going to see a lot more cases. We've already seen the divorce rate go up since the pandemic from 40 to 47%. So, you know, there will be a lot more economic inv- abuse in those stories. Yep. Um, so it's it's not something that's that's hidden anymore. I mean, that's nearly half the country. Is yeah, yeah, exactly right. Ending up in that situation. Yeah, and so. the, as you said, the lockdown has just amplified uh, the speed of that might that might be coming to light. So, uh, look, f- fantastic. Thanks, Amanda, for coming on the podcast and chatting about that. Um, obviously, this is a moving piece, and we, we look forward to keeping up with where it, where it heads to in this direction and, and how it evolves from here. But, uh, you know, I would encourage everybody to start um, now thinking and, and looking looking at noticing that within their own client base or, or their own communities around them. So thank you so much for hanging out. No worries. Thanks for having me. Been great. <laughs>